as well, all living things reproduce. Now this does not mean if you've chosen not to have children or you are unable to reproduce that you are no longer considered living. It's more in terms of as a species, all living things can reproduce. So even if I don't reproduce but someone else of the human species reproduces, now we're both considered living. Not all living things reproduce in the same way. Some, like humans, reproduce sexually. This is where the genetic material of one individual is combined with another to produce an offspring. The advantage of this is you get genetic diversity. Not everyone is alike. This is a good thing because it means if one person might be sensitive to some sort of toxin in the environment, they will die, but someone else has a different genetic makeup, they're able to survive, and therefore the entire species isn't wiped out. The other, the disadvantage though is you have to find a mate. You know, that whole dating process can be difficult and expensive, so there's downsides. Others, like bacteria, reproduce asexually. where the genetic material of only one individual is passed on to the offspring. The advantage of this, no dating. You don't have to find your mate. No mate selection. You don't have to put out yourself out there and fear rejection. The disadvantage is, in general, there's less genetic diversity, meaning they are more susceptible to changes within their environment. Now, just a reminder here, we use the term asexual above, and we want to remember that when we use prefix a in front of a word, it means not or without. You will see this throughout biology where a word is modified by adding a in front. So just for example, Typical can mean normal, atypical means not normal, okay? Interestingly, when we're talking about reproduction with humans, even though we reproduce sexually, at the organism level, our cells constantly reproduce asexually for the purpose of growth. Now remember, growth includes repair. And in fact, it's the inability of cells to properly undergo asexual reproduction that leads to aging and eventual death in humans, and actually in most living things. Another characteristic of all living things is that they are organized. This is not in reference to your room or your locker or your binder. It's in reference to your internal environment. So if you're disorganized, that does not mean you're dead. Okay, so all living things are organized. Typically, we look at the small level to the building up to the holistic level. So at the smallest level, we have atoms, which are the smallest particle of an element that retains the properties of the element. If, there's smaller things that make up an atom, but you break it apart, none of those things actually can exist on their own. So we have an atom. Okay. Then we have molecules. Am I drawing Mickey Mouse? No, we have water. So molecules are Whoops, sorry guys. That's going to happen occasionally when my hand hits the wrong spot on this screen. But for molecules, that's two or more atoms that are bonded together. They could be the same atom, like O2, or different atoms, like H2O. This progress, many molecules come together to form cells. And in the human cell, we're going to look at eukaryotes with a nucleus with some DNA in it. And then we get our ER. We'll have 
Golgi bodies. We'll go through this throughout the year. So cells are considered the smallest or basic unit of life. You can't get any smaller and be considered living. That means cells have to actually have all seven characteristics of life. And all living things are composed of one or more cells. Cells come together to form tissues. A good example of a tissue is muscle tissue. A little Popeye got going here. So a tissue is a group of similar cells working together for a common function. I'm going to abbreviate function throughout the year as FXN. If you can't remember that in brackets right now, write the full word behind it. So together for a common function, for example, muscle tissue, and the function is movement. Okay. Tissues then come together to form organs. For example, your heart. That includes two or more different tissues working together for a common function. In the case of your heart, you're looking at muscle and nerve tissue functioning to pump blood. Organs then come together to form systems. For example, your lungs working in conjunction with your diaphragm your oral cavity for the purposes of respiration. So it's two or more different organs working together for a common function. And finally, those all come together to form the functional whole. In this case, me carrying a rugby ball. So the organism is the functional whole. Add it all together and it works. And the last characteristic of all living things are that they adapt or evolve. So this is not something that occurs within the individual but more as a species all living things adapt or evolve over time. An adaptation just simply refers to a modification of living organism's DNA that benefits its chance of survival. So if you're a rabbit, you're born up in the north and your parents were brown and you were white and you're harder to see and catch, that's going to be an adaptation. Scientists believe that organisms adapt through the combined processes of random variation. Now you gotta think back to Bio 11 and Darwin's theory of evolution. So random variation, which is now known to be driven at the genetic level, either by com combining parents' genetics or through mutations, and natural selection. or survival of the fittest, where those organisms with traits best suited to their environment can actually survive, like the bunny in the Arctic, followed by reproduction. If you don't reproduce and you don't pass on those genetics, you actually won't evolve through time. So you have to have reproduction to pass on the beneficial trait. Now the beauty of adaptation or evolution is that it can be used to explain, understand, and maybe even to appreciate the unity or commonalities and diversity or differences of all living things. Now this is really relevant, one, just from a global perspective of understanding how we are all connected and also with respect to studying diseases in the human body and using other model organisms, well, how does it work that we can look at a mouse and compare it to a human body through the concepts of adaptation, evolution, the fact that we do have similar systems, 
help us be able to use these model systems. So that's the end of today, your very first video. It's longer than most are going to be, but this one we'll have done in class. In the future, we'll keep them a little shorter, and then we'll pick up the details within class. I hope this went well for you, and we'll talk about it in class. Have a good day.